possible to live through all the trials and to stand firm and sure. And he did so against the temptations of the devil. You remember we went through them. And now I want to go on to the most important part of having stakes. Um, I'm talking about the type that you drive into the ground, not the type that you devour if you're unwise. And um, it's the cords that go on the pins or the stakes or the pegs. And if you turn with me, the cords were linen cords. And linen speaks of Thank you. And in Hosea, righteousness. And in Hosea, and chapter 11, Hosea, should find him after Daniel if you're groping Hosea In Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1 we read when Israel was a child then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Now, you'll realize that Israel uh, that's referred to here is what? Hmm? talking about the nation because uh, you remember he wasn't in Egypt it was uh, Moses brought the children out I thought someone would remember we've done that story once or twice have we not anyone remember a little tale about the Israelites coming out of Egypt anyone remember it huh well dear oh dear I loved him and called my son out of Egypt they called them so they went from them they sacrificed unto Balaam and burned incense to graven images. I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them. And the awful thing about it is that God moved in and God called people and they went and they sacrificed to Balaam, first of all. And then he said he took them by their arms and led them and it says, they didn't even realize that I healed them, says God. I drew them with cords of a man, with bands of love. And I was to them as they that take off the yoke on their jaws, and I laid meat unto them. Now, God speaks always of cords of a man and bands of love and the cords represent the bands of love and between the states the word of God are the bands of love and the thing that one needs to do is know how it operates hmm? don't you and we're coming on to that but turn with me now to remember it's bands of love 2 Corinthians 5 And in verse 14, Paul writes, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. 
Now, it's interesting that Paul says that when he mentions the death and the resurrection of Christ, he says it's the love of Christ that constraineth us. That's 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. And the word constraineth there means to hold together. And the cords that went over the tabernacle did one thing. They held it together. They were the things that held the coverings down, you see. Um, if I put up a tent, um, if I did, uh, even a frame tent, and I could get one up, and I could knock all the pegs in, but if I didn't attach anything to them, what would happen when a strong wind came? Hmm? I would be chasing my tent down the road because you need it held down. And the guy ropes are very important. Or the girl ropes, whichever you prefer. Um, the, the ropes that go around are very important. They've got to be attached to something. Now, the trouble is with people that they get the word of God and promises of God into their life and the, the uh, likeness of Christ into their life, but there's nothing that kind of constrains them and holds the thing together. Their faith is, is a, just a, a, a hodgepodge of pegs everywhere. The first strong wind, there's nothing to hold anything down. And it's the cords that held the tabernacle together. And we need to see that we need a holding together. And that's why when Paul writes, he writes, it's the love of Christ that constrains or holds us together. And then he goes on to speak of his death and his resurrection. And if you turn to John's Gospel, chapter 12, Verse 32. Um, verse 32 says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Okay, have you got it there, John, chapter 12, verse 32? This, he said, signifying what death he should die. Now, it's interesting that Christ, when he speaks of being hung on the cross, says, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. Now, you, you might be interested to know that the word in the Greek of draw means to, um, to be pulled in on the end of a rope. You know that. In other words, you know, it's like holding a tent down. You pull it, don't you? The guy ropes attached and you pull it. And um, it means to draw. When Christ said, I'll draw all men in, he said it like he was going to pull you. As though he was pulling tight a rope to pull you in. That's what Christ meant. Isn't that interesting? Hmm? So you see, it's God in Christ who's pulling you in. And, you know, it's not like the fisherman. He doesn't play you for hours till he gets you exhausted. He just pulls you in. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's why it speaks of we have a hope, which is an anchor of our soul, you see. Christ who's entered within the veil because uh, we have a rope going out. It's no good having an anchor if you've got no rope attached, is it? Could you imagine that? An anchor with no rope attached, sling it over the side. First of all, you'd need to buy an anchor the next time you went out and secondly, it wouldn't keep you very still, would it? Uh, <laughs> well, some people's faith's like that. They toss an anchor over the side and there's nothing attached. They can't understand why it just goes plop. And that's the last they see of it, except for a goggle goggle um, from the air coming up. But you've got to have your whole being attached to it. And I want to explain what I mean, you see. Um, the pegs represent the person of Christ. 
The cords represent his work. And you see, you can't divorce one from the other. You see, most people will admit that Jesus Christ lived. And they will say, oh yes, he was a good man. And they will acknowledge that he walked the earth. And they will acknowledge that he was crucified. And they might even say that he went to heaven. But they will only acknowledge him as a man. And they won't connect his works with anything but an example that we should follow. You know, oh well, he, he's kind of a representation and we should desire to be like him. And that is very often the kind of gospel that you hear. But we need to preach not only Christ, but we need to preach his works. For instance, if you turn with one into 1 Corinthians chapter 2, One Corinthians chapter two. Four says Paul. Oh, let's take verse one. Uh, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now you see, Paul said, look, I don't just de de desire to know the person, I want to know what he did. You see, it's more important to know Christ and him crucified. Most people know Jesus. But I need to know Christ and him crucified. Because, you see, it's no good having a tent peg if you've got no cords to go over. And most people's whole conception of God is Jesus Christ. And they leave out the crucifixion. And why did Christ come to earth? And so, you see, Christ without his works would only divide man from God. Because if he'd come and just lived a perfect holy life and he hadn't died and atoned for my sin and been my substitute and my lamb on Calvary, all he would have done was show me a standard and a life and a way of being that so far exceeded anything I could attain to, it would only have brought condemnation. So the example of Christ without his works is to all men. You know, Paul says, if Christ be dead and the dead rise on, he said, then your faith is vain. You're yet in your sins. And we need to go beyond and see that we don't need to know Jesus. We need to know Jesus Christ and him crucified. I need to know not only who and what Jesus is, but I need to know what he did and what he does in my life. I don't need to just know the truths about him. I need to know experimentally the drawing and keeping and all-embracing power of the Christ of God in his working in me. They're the cords. And your life will never be grounded in God if it's just based on the Christ of God and not on the doings of the Christ of God. And I want to go on and explain it more fully. Um, if you look on uh, to Hebrews chapter 7, and Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24, says this but this man Jesus because he continueth ever hath an unchangeable priesthood 
Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Now, why does Christ live? And is able to do what? Is able to do what in you? Total, uttermost salvation. Now, you see, I might learn all about Jesus Christ. I might learn about the wonderful way he walked, the way when he was 12 he went off and he kind of argued with the scribes and the Pharisees and the high priests in the temple and he put them all to rights and they marveled at his wisdom and then he went back to the carpenter's shop, worked for Joseph, he lived, went out, healed the sick and all that I can believe and know. But then comes a problem. I need to know what work Jesus will do for me. You see, just knowing about him without it being related to my own individual life, it's just like locking a lot of stakes into the ground and just saying, well, you know, I've fixed the tent now. That's really made my life secure. All the beliefs might be right and it might be absolutely on the person of Jesus. But I need to know what he does and what he did. I must understand his workings. And he ever lives to make intercession. I need to know that my Jesus in heaven is ever interceding for me. Hmm? That's his work. He looks down and he says, Father, and then he intercedes. What a mess he is, Father. But oh, 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 oh meet their need. Hmm? And he's ever interceding. Glory to God. It's good, isn't it? Jesus, your advocate before Father. And he's always got the correct plea. Father, the blood. The answer to everything. Every accusation, the blood. Every failure, the blood. Every shortcoming, the blood. Everything answers to the blood. And we can know that Jesus Christ has got an answer and he's ever interceding for you and for me. Isn't that wonderful? And that's an unchanging thing. Don't think that when you get saved and when you get a pure heart that Jesus stops interceding for you. He doesn't. He intercedes all the more. Because he knows that without the keeping power of God, we're all lost. So he's forever interceding to Father. Father, keep him. And he sees you walk into a situation... Father, he says. Phew, how are they going to get out of that, Father? Oh, you better help him, Father. The spirit moves at Father's bidding. Reveals the things of Jesus. And you go on. Ever interceding. And you've got to know that. It's that knowledge that Jesus is ever interceding that binds you into God. It's that knowledge that Jesus really cares. That's why Paul writes, the love of Christ constraineth us. Think we've got a high priest in the heavens, absolutely spotless and pure, standing in the presence of God, interceding for us. How about that? No one can come in his way, so don't you intercede. He has a right because of the blood to intercede for you and to intercede for me that blood has bought the right for us always to have access to God through Jesus Christ we can always get forgiveness now because of that blood and because Jesus is there and is ever interceding isn't that wonderful 
Anything you do, any little failure, before you pray, Jesus has already interceded. Yes. Before you can have time to think your confession, let alone make it, Jesus has already said, Father, blood. Mm. It's good you've got a high priest like that, isn't it? Makes atonement. Some of you keep him busy. Huh? So do I. You know, when you know he's ever there interceding for you. Hmm? Isn't that wonderful? Gives you confidence. Nothing can come in the way. I've got Jesus on my side. Hmm? You don't have to plead and grovel any longer. Try and get through to God. Just say, my Jesus is there already interceding for me. He's my representative. He's my advocate. He's doing a good job. And do you know he never lost one case? Not like the earthly advocates. It's a 50-50 chance there, isn't it, Carolyn? But you see, in the heaven there's... He always wins. Glory to God. He's interceding for me and for you. <coughs> Isn't that wonderful? Hmm? That's why he draws us with cords of love. And that's why the anchor is within the veil. And your hope should be attached to it. See, we have an anchor to the soul and that's the hope and what is the hope when we see Jesus we're going to be like him and Jesus is ever interceding to father for us so that we can be perfected and become like him that's his continual work in an unchanging priesthood and when you've got Jesus praying for you Remember when he prayed, he went outside a tomb one day and with a dead body in there, people said, don't take the stone away by this time he stinketh. And Jesus just came along and he said, okay, take the stone away. And they took the stone away. Lazarus, come forth. And out came this mummified figure person who uh, came out wrapped up in these whatever you call them name's gone right out grave clothes <laughs> and it's a useful thing to wear in a grave and uh, better than the morning suit and and there he was in his grave clothes and they they unwrapped him and, and let him go now that wasn't resurrection he came back to life. Jesus called his spirit back to his body and Lazarus died again when he came out of the tomb. And this is resurrection life, which we have. He just wrapped the grave clothes up himself, he just folded up the napkin in the, in the other side of the grave and then stepped straight out through the wall. I mean, our Jesus did. He didn't need anyone to let him go. Lazarus did, you see. So you've got to get your truths right hmm? and understand them. Otherwise you end up with error. Lots of preachers preach on Lazarus as though it's resurrection. Nothing to do with it. He just came back to life and died a man again. See? But anyway, there you see this Jesus. When he was outside the tomb, he said, Father, and he prayed, and he said, Father, he said, I know you always hear me, but for their sakes I pray. And it was written down, you see, faithfully. Now, Jesus said, I know you always hear me, Father, and he just called someone back from the dead, you see, and out he came out of the grave. But he just prayed it, you know, for our sakes. Huh? Now, you know, that same Jesus who stood outside the tomb is now in heaven before Father interceding for you and Father always hears him Jesus said it I said Father I know you always hear me 
And you imagine he's the one who's praying for you. Why? Doesn't that give you confidence? Well, he, Father always hears him. Anything he ever prayed always happened. Not like my prayers. I prayed, you know, it didn't happen. But Father always hears Jesus, and he's there for you, interceding for you. It's not your little prayers that you dribble out once a week that's getting you there. It's Jesus. He's there. He's not kind of a, <laughs> and groaning a prayer. So, Father, he says, look at that one. Perfect them. Readjust them, Father. Do this, do that. Or demolish them, Father, and reconstruct them would be more accurate. <laughs> and Father always does what Jesus prays. Interceding for us. Doesn't it give you confidence? Huh? My. It does for me. When I think about it. Glory to God. And it's important that we understand. Let's read on. In uh, uh, It says, uh, For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. See, Jesus just made one offering, which was full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice. And that's it. Now, the interesting thing is, you see, about the cords, that we need to say, as I said, they're cords of love, and they hold the thing together, and they're the truths that hold it together. It's the workings of Christ. It's what he did that's so important for us, and what he does for us now. And you will find that many people are quite happy to have the stakes or the pegs in their life that, are, that is truths which are biblical about Christ. They will accept that Jesus Christ lived as a person. They will accept that he walked holy upon the earth, but they don't believe that he was God. Have you ever met people like that? Well, I accept all about him, but I don't accept his deity. And so they'll deny his deity. Now, if you take the deity away from the Christ of God and just take the person without the deity, you've got the pegs without the cord. Because, you see, everything's upheld by the power of his word, we're told in Hebrews 1. Everything was created by him. And if that wasn't so, and he was just a man, then he was a liar, because he said that he was God. He said he was the Son of God. He testified that I am that I am. They said, you know, being a man, you're making yourself God. So he must have been a liar. But he wasn't. He was God. And he testified so. And you take the deity away and it's like just having truths about his life without the thing that holds it together and his workings. And the same thing's true of the cross. I mean, a lot of people that believe that Jesus was crucified by wicked men. But when you come and say, do you believe that he was the atoning lamb and that he died and took your sin. They say, oh, no, no. I believe that we all have to answer for what we have done, each one of us. I'm responsible for my actions. And you will find that they will always want to minus. They'll accept the cross, minus the atonement. They won't accept that Christ atoned. Once again, it's having the truths of the pegs without the cords. And the cords are the work that Christ actually accomplished. The cross 
was to bring atonement. It was the work of uniting us with God and making us one with God again. It was the work of blotting out our sin, of shedding his blood and becoming the spotless lamb of God. People will accept the social gospel, the social implications of Christ, but what they don't like are the challenges to their person. You cannot do anything good. You cannot get yourself in relationship with God. It's Christ who atoned for you. And they don't like the atonement. Have you noticed that when you talk to people? They'll go so far with you. Once you come to the atonement, uh -uh, they don't want to know. I don't believe he died for me. They won't accept that personal implication. And that is the thing that brings people into relationship with God and begins to tie their life into God when you believe on the atonement. And always look out. If people accept and say, I believe Jesus was a good man, all they're doing is taking the truths of the person without the work that he did. If they say, I believe in the cross, but don't accept the atonement, they're taking the truth of the cross, denying the work of it. They always go that way. God was crucified on Calvary's cross. Only God was righteous. Therefore, only Christ, being God, could possibly have fulfilled all righteousness. Because only God's righteous. Uh, Nicodemus came and said, Good master, Jesus said, There's none good save God. See? And Nicodemus ignored that and said, Well, what, what can I do? He said, See? Uh, Except a man be born again. You see, now what he asked was, good master. Jesus' answer, none good, save God. Now, Jesus' answer, if it was true, only God could atone for man. Because only God is righteous. Only God could atone in righteousness to God. Because only God is righteous. Do you understand that? And we cannot come into union with God unless we believe in the deity of Christ. The fundamental teaching of the gospel, and I mean Jesus is God. He is co-equal. He is equal. He is God. Might I say that there is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. These three are in one, and it is a mystery. But Son did not proceed from Father by birth. He always is, he always was, and he took on the fashion of a Son in order to exemplify to the world his divinity and to show forth the fatherhood of God. But he was God, always, eternally, ever God. The Spirit, he took on the function of the work of God and moved upon the earth, but he always is, he always was, and ever shall be God the Spirit, totally equal with Father and with Son, of the same nature, the same substance, the same Spirit and Godhead and Father. They are God. Understand it and understand it well. God atoned to God for man. Take away the deity of Christ Say, ah, but he was only the son of God. And you deny the atonement. God, the Father. God, the Son. God, the Holy Spirit. It's a mystery. You'll never, ever know. Because it's a mystery. 
And if you did know, it wouldn't be a mystery. One day you'll know even as you're known, but you won't know all mysteries. Because if you knew them, they wouldn't be, would they? But it is the deity of Christ, and understand that the truths of the workings of God through Jesus Christ are essential for your belief and for your holding a right relationship with the Christ of God. Your life is never stable until you understand that Jesus is God. I meet many, many people who cannot understand the Trinity. I want to confess something. Neither can I. But I know there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and they are three in one. They always have been, they always are, and they ever shall be. That's why Jesus is called the Alpha and the Omega. That's why Jesus is called the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Say, so, but how can he be Father and Son? Well, he is. He's called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Who was the Prince of Peace? Who's our Counselor? And yet his Everlasting Father. God is God. And we must understand that and understand it well. And the things that Jesus did are essential to our understanding of the gospel. You see, Jesus died for you. Now, the purpose that Jesus came to earth was to... Now, it wasn't just to live a holy life. So if you only know about Jesus as the person and you don't realize his purpose and his work, what you've got is the stakes in the ground, but nothing that holds the work together. Many people have that in their lives. They know all about Jesus, but it doesn't apply personally. You know, they can depersonalize Jesus Christ. There are men who go to universities and they study the person of Christ for years and they write books on it. And yet, it doesn't affect them as people because they're just studying the person of Christ. You see, it's his workings that draw the thing together. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. But I have to see him lifted up to be drawn. I need to know him not as Jesus, but Jesus Christ and. And it's only as I know him crucified that I'm drawn unto him. The drawing power of Jesus is in the crucifixion. So if I only know Jesus Christ and I don't go on to know him crucified, I don't ever get drawn into his life. Do you understand? And we're making myself plain. In other words, I just have the pins but no cords. Or I don't have an anchor for my soul that enters between the veil. It's all obvious, really. If you go on with me now to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8. And this is the scripture that you always want to quote to any Jehovah Witness. Uh, because if they look in their book, they get this little green book, they haven't got an answer to this scripture. Russell forgot to write one. So always turn them to Hebrews 1. You always get a Jehovah Witness on this one. And he'll say, I'll have to go back and ask my leader. And they usually do that and never come back. But um, he says, it says here, verse 8, But unto the Son, he said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Now, 
what I ask them, I, and, and you know, even in their perverted version, it says, oh God. And I said, now if God's speaking, and they agree with that, and he calls Jesus God, was he wrong? And they look at the back in their notes, and it says nothing about it. So they close their notes. And they look in the other little green book they carry with them. So there's nothing there either. So then they say they have to go back and ask their leader. Ah, it always amuses me that. And it says, A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Now you'll notice it's righteousness, and, but there is none good save God, said Jesus. So he could hardly have held the scepter of righteousness if he wasn't God. <coughs> You understand? Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth. Here, God is saying to Jesus, Lord, thou hast laid the foundation of the earth. Now if God's calling him Lord, <coughs> and he's below and what's God doing exalting him above they have no answer uh, and the heavens are the works of thine hands they shall perish but thou remainest Jesus remains and they shall wax old as doth a garment and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels saith he at any time, Sit on my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits, sent forth to minister for them, who shall be the heirs of salvation? You see, uh, let's read on. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard, God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders, and with divers miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. God confirms his word how? That's why I, I like to know, you know? always want to hear about the miracles and the signs and the wonders and gifts of the Holy Ghost if I find a church doesn't function at all in gifts and there are no miracles around then you know I know that God's not wanting to confirm his word there and therefore if God doesn't want to confirm it I don't think I should remain James chapter 1 verse 2 my brethren Count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. All right? If you want nothing, and you want to be one of those who's wanting nothing, what have you got to go through? temptation you've got to have your faith tried and you remember that brass speaks of the trying of your faith you know it speaks of Christ's faith that was tried therefore we can rely on it but the cords are the things that bind that faith into our life what we do and it's interesting you see the faith is based on the word that Jesus spoke and the word is Jesus Christ but the cords are the doings and therefore you see the trial of your faith is very important it's the very cords that bind in the truths of God into your life bind it to the word and therefore you go on and of course and in James chapter 2 as we were sharing this morning because someone asked me 
preempting what I wanted to say tonight. Uh, it says in verse 14, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? No. If a brother or a sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Now I just want to explain this scripture. It's an illustration of how stupid it would be to turn round to a starving man and say, because you believe you've got faith, be warmed and filled, and then do nothing about it. That would be ridiculous. And so Paul says it's just as ridiculous to say you've got faith when you've got no works. But what are the works? Now it explains what the works are. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. I once said that to a clergyman, and he got angry. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. And I like to know that it's put in at this point, you see, where faith without works is dead, you see. You can believe and have all the stakes in, but it won't bring any substance and reality in your life if the cords aren't round. The first trial of your faith, and the whole lot's gone. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by faith was faith made perfect? Sorry, I read that wrong, did I? And by works was faith made perfect. You see, by works... It's no good believing when God speaks if you don't act upon the word that he speaks. Let me give you an example. God came to Abraham and said that Sarah, his wife, would conceive. If Abraham had done nothing about it, but just believed God's word, what would have been produced? What you sow, you'll reap. But Abraham <laughs> tried. Abraham had to do something about it. And it says that Sarah even got delight in her old age. The thing is, you have to understand, faith without works is ridiculous. Now, Abraham obviously came together with Sarah, knew Sarah, and she conceived. Now, it would be no good Abraham saying, oh, I believe it, and doing nothing about it. And he was 100. <laughs> Some of you got a long way to go. And you, you have to understand, now, also, God said, take thine only son Isaac and offer him. So Abraham took him. And he took him to an altar. And he laid him on the altar. Now you see, it wasn't in believing what God said that was faith. It was believing and doing. You see, faith wrought with works becomes reality. But faith, just the acquiescent belief of the truth, without acting upon it, is dead. 
It's ridiculous. It's like saying to the starving man, be warmed and filled and giving him nothing. You'll just die of starvation. And in your life, if you won't act upon the word of God, you're finished. You're just a humbug. You're stupid. You're dead. You're hopeless. You're lost. You're hypocritical. You're dark. You're mad. You're crazy. You're a lunatic. In fact, you're dead. You've got to do something. You see, the word of God comes, but you've got to do. That's why it really calls me. When people come to me, and as I say, and I'll say it again, and you're one of the people, don't laugh at others. It'll be you I'm talking about. I'm talking to everyone. People come to me and they ask advice, and they say, so-and-so, so-and-so. So I see, and they go away. Three months later, they come back and they ask advice. I say the same thing. And their faith is totally dead. They won't do it. And then they can't understand why they're not going on with God and why their marriage isn't working out and why their finance is working out and why this isn't working out and why their job's not going well. And well, their faith's dead. They won't ever do what the Bible says. They won't follow biblical principle. And then they go, oh, dear, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I can't believe. No, of course you can't. If you won't act upon the word of God, you'll never believe. You see, faith's made perfect. By what? And if you don't do it, then you'll find you'll always live with doubts and unbelief. You'll be plagued with them. You've got to act upon the word of God. Mary turned to the people at the wedding feast and she said, whatsoever he saith, listen to him. But most people, oh, they love to listen to a good sermon. Come up to you afterwards and say, that was a good word, brother. And you watch them the next week. They're not doing anything, you know, about it. But they enjoyed it. Really ministered to their spirit. <sighs> oh, you know, deep down inside. A load of old humbug. See, so you've got to do it. Now that tabernacle represented Christ and the cords represented the work of Christ and the tabernacle was held intact in a life and in your life by your works. If you won't obey the words that God speaks and act upon them, then the life that you receive will just vanish away. There's nothing to hold it in place. That's why obedience is so essential let's read on and it says this and the scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God you see then how that by works Read it. I didn't write it. You read it. You see by... Now read it again. Do you understand that? It's by works, not just by faith. Because faith without works is dead. So you must have both going together. And it's no good having the stakes around the tabernacle without the cords going over the top. They just don't work. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Put in a load of tent pegs with no guy ropes. Tent's going to blow away in the first wind. Trial of your faith won't stand up. And you've got to have faith and works in your life. You've got to have faith, and faith cometh by hearing the word of God. But you go beyond that, and you've got to do it in obedience. Don't just be hearers of the word. 
But because he that heareth the word and look into the perfect law of liberty and goeth away straight away forgetteth what manner of man he was so is everyone that and doeth it not hears and done do it a lot of people like that they, they love to come and hear oh yeah great truth never do anything you see you've got to be doers of the word not hearers only let's just turn to the uh, last scripture which is 2 Corinthians 10 Verse 5, do you remember the scripture? Casting down reasonings and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to what? In other words, you have to obey. Now most people like to hear the word, like to read the word, but the very last thing they think of doing is obeying and you see faith without works is dead you can believe all the right things you can have all the right doctrine but if you don't amend your life and live that way and obey the word well your faith is dead and you will go to hell because you deserve to and your condemnation will be all the greater because you knew the truth and didn't do it. Remember Romans 1? Talked about those that hold the truth of God in unrighteousness. And you've got to hold the truth of God in righteousness. In other words, you've got to let the life of Christ be in you. You've got to obey the word. Not just believe it, but you've got to do it. And that is why the pins were made of brass and they were put round and God had cords over the tabernacle to hold it in place and that's why in Hosea it speaks of cords of love that had drawn them and yet it says that they didn't know that it was God who had healed them even though it was bands of love that were drawing them together that's why Paul writes it's the love of God that constraineth us that means draweth us in together and compacts us together but it was by what God did. And you see, Christ, do you remember? The testimony of God over Christ was God so loved the world that he gave. It was what God did. Love without works. Faith without works is dead. Love without works is just as dead. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God did something about it. God saw our nakedness, he saw our hunger, he saw our poverty. So he did something about it. And unless you realize and do something about the word of God in you, your faith is vain and it's dead. If you don't obey the principles of God's word and if you're dodging the principles of God, you are basically out of God completely. You're conning yourself you're kidding yourself. Disobedience is as the sin of witchcraft. No cords. There'll never be any stable stability in your life until not only do you believe truths, but you act upon them and you live them in your daily life in simple, plain obedience. That's what draws you into Christ. If you want to know how to get a closer relationship with God, it's simple. Read the Bible and start obeying it. Start humbling yourself, accepting God's word at face value and being obedient. You'll soon find God in a deeper and greater measure because it's the love of God that constrains us and pulls us in. 
Hmm? Jesus said, if I be lifted up and you lift up the word of God and you begin to worship it and the Christ of the cross and you begin to deny yourself and enter into that cross of Christ, then it says, I'll draw all men unto me and you'll get pulled in on a rope straight into God and you'll end up on a cross. That's the altar. You've got to present your body as a living sacrifice unto God. Start obeying and you'll find you'll have to present your body. It's obedience. You've got to give up all of self and self-desire and self-will and self-love and self-righteousness and come unto him who's the only righteous one, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Lord you see each heart here you know us oh God thank you that Jesus is the one who makes intercession for us thank you it's his blood that was shed for us oh God Lord deal with the faith which is dead show us that it's by obedience to your word not just believing but obeying the truths that you speak that brings us into reality teach us O oh God that just belief mere belief intellectual belief profits nothing it is only by a true dying to self that we live unto thee and produce fruit unto thee. Lord, forgive those of us who have lived for ourselves. Make us true disciples. May we deny ourselves, tape up our cross, and be obedient to thy word, following thee. In Jesus' name,